Um, hello everyone, welcome to the uh, program counselor and career advisor study abroad info session. So today we have our program counselor representative Melinda from the Bachelor of Landscape Archi Architecture program and our career services representative Luisa joining us uh, to share their information about how to feed a study abroad program in your degree and uh, the positive impacts that a study abroad program can have on your academic and professional development. Um, so uh, the info session will be in Q&A style, so I will be asking questions to the program counselor first and then switch to career advisor. And if you have any questions about any of the uh, information, feel free to send them in in the chat box. So I have uh, the first question for career counselor career advice, sorry, program counselor. Uh, the first question is, what academic supports are available to students uh, they're interested in studying abroad? For, for program counselors. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So hi everyone. Uh, yeah, as Ken mentioned, my name is Melinda. I'm a program counselor in the Ontario Agricultural College. So I work with landscape architecture. I also work with uh, Bachelor of Bioresource Management and the Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. Uh, so tons of supports out there. I definitely recommend um, your first go-to would be your program counselor, just to sort of get some feelers out about how an exchange might work with your specific major in your degree program, really getting those um, sort of hashed out before you start considering it. Um, there might be some programs where it's a little more restrictive. One of the majors that I work with, it's really tight to try and fit in an exchange. So having that conversation is really helpful. Uh, and a lot of your programs will also have uh, faculty advisors. So I work in conjunction with uh, faculty advisors for my program. Um, again, just to sort of see how does it fit in, um, what types of courses you should be going for. So lots of academic support out there. Um, and there would be um, academic support at your host institution as well. And that would be determined by your host institution. So taking advantage both of your Guelph contacts as well as the um, host institution that you end up going to uh, once you're accepted there are, are two really good resources for you to connect with when talking about exchange and when, when you're on exchange. Thanks, Melinda, for the information. And then uh, just so usually for study abroad, we ask students to work with their uh, program counselor ahead of time to decide what kind of courses they uh, they are, they, are th they should be taking while they're on, on exchange and whether courses can be transferred back uh, to their degrees. So it's a uh, those are good advi good advice. And next question is for our career advisor, and maybe Luisa, if um you can just introduce yourself, and then the question is. Uh, what are some current trends in the workforce and how might international experience help students to be more competitive when they are applying for jobs? Sure, so great question and thanks so much for having me. So hi everyone, my name is Louisa and I'm a career advisor here at the University of Guelph and I work specifically with students and faculty in the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences. So when I think about international experience and what that means, it really just means that you have now a wealth of experience to put on your resume. So that can mean you're really highlighting different times where you highlighted uh, time management skills, uh, different times where you highlighted your problem solving skills. So you're really just finding different ways to um, kind of highlight some additional new skills that you put on your resume. And in terms of making yourselves marketable for that, um, there's of course you can work with us uh, career advisors here at the university to help you figure out how to market those skills as well um, and how to make yourself more competitive that's a question that we often get uh, from students uh, at the at the experiential learning hub as well so one way to make yourself more competitive is just to learn what the different trends are in the different industries that you're interested in so finding out what the different trends are that are available and starting to um, perhaps find different experiences like study abroad experience that uh, can really start to highlight those skills to make you more competitive. That's one way. And then, of course, like I mentioned, feel free to book an appointment with us for either a resume review, cover letter review, and we're happy to help you, you know, not just market those skills, but figure out and even reflect on what those skills are in the first place.
Jen, I think you're on mute. I think I'm on mute. So next question is for Melinda. So the question is, can you advise students as to when they might want to consider participating in an exchange? Yeah, that's a great question. I do again think it will become um, more dependent on what program you're in. Uh, typically third and fourth year makes the most sense for the programs that I work with. And I do think logistically they make sense probably for a lot of programs as well. Uh, you do need to keep sort of the CIP, Center for International Programs, timelines in mind as well. Uh, they have one application date, which is uh, late in January. So if you apply, um, if you apply in January, you'll have access to exchange for the following summer, fall and winter. So if you are looking to do an exchange in your winter of your third year, you're actually thinking about it at the start of your second um, year because you'll have to attend a session put on by CIP to really get you started on finding out more information about exchange. So the idea behind that is that you're really starting, I'm going to say at least a year in advance, even more so to really think about when you're going to go. And again, connecting with your program counselor to find out where in your program there's a good sort of gap for you to be able to leave and take um, an exchange. There are some programs where there might be a critical course that you need to be um, on campus at Guelph doing like a winter course in your final semester. I think a lot of the times semester eight doesn't work for a lot of programs. So again, I think that's a conversation to have, but you really are looking at working with those timelines and thinking that your application at the very least needs to be done a year in advance. So you really are thinking a year and a bit in advance to start having those conversations. So for sure, uh, if you're in first year, why not start having those conversations now? If you're in second year, you're really considering having those conversations. Uh, if you're in third year, hope you've had the conversations already. Um, so it's really just sort of watching those timelines about when you need to apply and then having that conversation about when it might make the most sense to go within your program. Again, sometimes a fall or a winter might make a difference between you missing on some core courses that you need to do. So having that conversation and being aware of what you're requirements are and how that might fit in with an exchange is a good conversation to have well in advance. Yeah, thanks for the feedback and the uh, next question is for the career advisor. Uh, what are some of the transferable intercultural skills that a student may gain from participating in a study abroad program? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, the main skills that come to mind for me is just um, understanding what diversity truly means. So, you know, we've seen, especially in the recent months, uh, an uptick in people looking for uh, people working in diversity. So diversity coordinator, diversity manager. So uh, having that study abroad experience really gives you a different kind of understanding of what different cultures might look like. So that might look like, you know, a different way of working, a different style of communicating. So you're really starting to understand how different cultures work. Of course, just you being a part of the study abroad experience as well, that does bring about other different skill sets too, even just in the application process. You know, that's you managing your time. So managing your coursework alongside the whole process of being considered for a study abroad application, right? So there are many different skills that you're utilizing and learning, not just at your study abroad experience, but even still leading up to that as well. Yeah, probably um, be more mindful when you are uh, on exchange, like what are some moments that it's good for learning the intercultural skills and then try to um, put those moments into words and then how to think to incorporate those into your resume. Yeah, uh, so the next question is, what is the academic value of study abroad? I often have uh, students asking, for example, uh, a study abroad program, a co-op program, and doing a minor. What are the like differences in terms of those different programs uh, in terms of like the academic value of those and then what are the values of doing a study abroad program? The question for Melinda. Yeah, Chen, it's a it's a really good question to be asking. Um, I really do think that there's value in everything that Louisa just said in terms of gaining those skills and so forth. What I encourage students to do when they go on exchange is to take a course that we don't offer here. Why not take advantage of your host institution, 
go on exchange and learn from their experts. I had a student out on exchange in the winter semester. She's um, in our equine management program. She actually met the author of a, a textbook and a paper that is in an area of study that she was just fascinated by. And he taught one of her classes. Like you're not going to get that. Well, okay, you might get that at Guelph, but you're not going to get these international connections without going abroad. Um, another good example is students in landscape architecture. A few of them have gone and I forget the institution that it's at, but there's a furniture making course. We don't offer furniture making here at Guelph, but it's such a cool tactile different way of looking at how things get put together that really um, accompanies the idea behind their degree program landscape architecture and looking at the aesthetics, the comfort and all of that. So again, I think there's a lot of academic value in being able to do again, building your global skills and all of that, but also taking courses that we don't necessarily offer here. I also think that there's value, even if there's a similar ish course, talk to your program counselor, you're not going to get away with duplicating courses. Um, but for example, for my agriculture students, learning about animal production in any other country is quite different than Canada. We have different policies, we have different climate, we have different atmospheres. So learning those different global aspects, I think is a really valuable asset and connecting back to careers. If you're going to work in your industry and maybe work with um, some global connections, understanding how things are done in other countries through taking these courses, I think has a very, very good valuable asset on the academic side for sure. Um, so the next question is, uh, if students are interested in making their resume and cover letter more internationalized, uh, what kind of supports are available from Korea services to help students to do that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so first thing that comes to mind, of course, are just uh, resume reviews and cover letter reviews. So you can easily book some time with your career advisor through Experience Guelph. Um, so we're available, you know, multiple times during the week uh, at times that can fit your schedule. So I would suggest that you uh, have a look at some times that might work for you. So um, yeah, there's there's cover letter reviews, resume reviews, like I mentioned. Um, there's also just if you want to talk about, you know, how study abroad experiences can fit into your career journey and your career goals, you can also book some time to chat with us about that. You know, we're always open to have more general conversations about, you know, I'm not sure if this study abroad program would fit into my career goals or how do I market myself once I come back from the study abroad experience. You can always book an appointment with one of us to talk about that and figure out a different way to, you know, maybe think about problems that you had solved in your study abroad. Think about how to reflect on the coursework that you had and to verbalize that to share with employers um, on your resume and in interviews as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a comment uh, to make about the academic values of studying abroad. Uh, we have a student who's studying uh, ho hospitality and uh, tourism management, and she went on exchange in Hong Kong at the Hong Kong Polytech University. And that partner university is also a, spe a universe, uh, university that specializes in hospitality and tourism management. So she actually got a kind of an internship experience as part of her course to work at the hotel at the university. So I think that is a cool experience and then it also adds value that you can put this experience in your resume. So the next question for the program counselor is, um, what happens if a student wants to change a course while they're on exchange? And uh, what other um, maybe policies and the regulations around course taking while they're on exchange? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can't emphasize enough having a conversation with your program counselor all throughout this process at the very start confirming will this work with my program? Will I be able to sort of count courses back and how will they fit in with my program? But while you're on exchange, if you do sort of shift your courses and it will happen, my gosh, I had someone look me in the eye, shake my hand and say I'll never change my courses. He changed his courses. Everyone's going to change their courses. So before you go, you'll have an agreement with your program counselor. Yes, these are the courses I'm going to take. You're going to go. You're going to meet some friends. They're going to say, oh, you should take this course instead. You're going to take their advice. You're going to change your courses around. Um, but again, having that communication is going to be critical because you don't want to swap into a course that maybe won't count back towards your degree program. 
Um, a lot of instances would be if it's a re repeat of a course you've done already, definitely don't take those courses because you won't get approval to have them count towards your degree program. And again, you might be looking for specific requirements that you need to get while you're on exchange. So you'll really want to have that conversation if you're going to switch courses. You'll also want to work with your host institution. Um, sort of the complicated process throughout all of this is that everyone does things differently. Uh, you will not find another school that operates the same way as Guelph. I always say use Guelph sort of as a model, but a lot of schools do do things differently, so they'll have different rules and regulations about switching courses at their institution. Um, I would argue that we're probably pretty open with you switching here at Guelph, but you do also have to be in contact with your host institution and see if they have allowances for switching courses as well. But again, having that clear communication of I'm no longer taking this course, I want to take this course instead is really critical to have with your program counselor before you make the switch. Because again, if you get yourself into a situation where you take a course, you come back and you say, hey, these are all the courses I took. If you don't have approval to take all of them, uh, you run the risk of not being able to count all of them towards your degree program. So really having that line of communication open is going to be critical. But again, listen to the new friends you're going to make, listen to the new advisors you're going to have. Uh, and if they recommend maybe a shift in courses, then definitely consider it and see what the advice is from your program counselor and moving forward and doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for the great insight. and. Uh, Next question is uh, uh, whether or why is intercultural effectiveness important to the workplace? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think intercultural effectiveness, I mean, just the ability to kind of interact and collaborate with different people from different backgrounds, I think that in itself is a valuable skill set to employers. So I've been seeing more and more with employers, they're really interested in hiring people with the diverse backgrounds. So uh, as an example, you know, hiring software developers, that's an up and coming field or a field that's really increasing drastically as many of us know, but uh, some employers are really starting to reach out and maybe they're more inclined to hire someone with a psychology background because they're coming in with a different set of eyes and they're coming in with a different problem solving mindset than perhaps someone who might be classically trained in software development. So the same kind of idea applies here with intercultural effectiveness. You're seeing things from a different mindset, perhaps by seeing different policies in uh, different countries, by seeing different uh, ways of communication and problem solving in different countries. You're now bringing that back and you're sharing that with employers. And I think that that is really a valuable skill set that uh, a lot of employers are looking for nowadays. Um, so the next question, uh, how does course credit transfer works? Work? Yeah, so I'll say I'll argue a simple ish process, but it is quite involved. Um, what happens is you do get credits back towards the University of Guelph. Um, the layers of complexity come in when we talk about what it will look like on your Guelph transcript um, and then the credit count itself. That's a little bit of a nuanced thing that I'll just give you a heads up on. But in terms of the credit, so what will happen is before you go on exchange, you'll enroll in a course called free 2000. It might be another free depending on how many credits you're taking, but that's a placeholder that sits on your academic transcript to indicate that you're currently on exchange. And the idea behind that is you do pay the Guelph tuition fees and that is sort of triggered by having that. But again, it's also a placeholder. OSAP will know that you're sort of taking classes by this placeholder course. When you return after all those conversations you've had about what courses you're taking and all of that and how they'll count, we have to, I call it Guelph Eyes, our exchange uh, credits. And the idea behind that is you'll be given um, courses that fit into the Guelph sort of structure. So for example, um, if you took a marketing course there and under them it was called a marketing management and consumer course but here we call it marketing uh, consumer studies we need to give you an mcs credit instead of whatever their acronym would be so we would look to give you a similar acronym so again if you took a marketing course we would give you a marketing mcs is what it is for us here and then so when someone looks at your transcript how do we indicate it wasn't taken at 12 It'll start with a nine and the nine is sort of a weird thing for us to have on our Guelph transcripts because we're used to it starting with a one, two, three or four. But the nine indicates that you didn't take the course at Guelph. 
second digit will then indicate what your level is and then through a really subtle nuance it'll end with a zero one to get to our typical four digits that actually indicates that you took it on exchange so if someone really knows how to use your guelph transcript well they'll know right away that those are exchange credits and that's sort of the conversation you'll have with your program counselors what will they look like on your transcript and going forth from there uh, the hardest part is sort of figuring out what they will come back as um, i'll have students go and take courses like archaeology we don't have archaeology here so sometimes it's a bit of a a little bit of a negotiation or they'll take Japanese. We don't have Japanese here, uh, so sometimes the nuances get a little difficult, but we work with you on what they're going to come back as. Um, I will quickly highlight credits. Credits are always an interesting component because again, not everyone does the thing, same things Guelph does. A lot of other institutions, five is not the typical amount of courses you'll take. So we do run into some instances where you may go to, for example, uh, Sweden has a school, don't ask me to pronounce it, short form is SLU, um, but they only take two courses and that's the same as a full time. And we'll actually put that into 2.5 credits. So it really gets complicated in that regard. And again, that's why con communicating with your program counselor is really important. There's another um, school, Boku. You may end up taking 10 courses, which seems ridiculous, but that's just the way their credit counts work. So you may have to have a bunch of quarter credits sitting on your transcript. So there are some nuances there. And again, having a conversation with your program counselor about what it's going to look like on your transcript and being aware of how your host institution offers their courses, what their credit count is like. Uh, I don't want to say Europe is easy, but Europe has like sort of a centralized credit system, which is amazing. So we already know that 30 credits there is 2.5 here. Uh, but again, some of the other schools get a little nuanced in terms of what their credit system is. But again, even some courses, you don't necessarily take five to get 30. So you'll have to work on the math a little bit. But again, keeping in touch, watching those credit counts. Um, I've had one student unfortunately get into a bit of trouble because they didn't realize the course wasn't worth as many credits as they thought. So definitely be watching for that type of stuff. And then know that when you come back, that's not the time to have the conversation about how your credits will come back and what they'll look like. Um, at least having it while you're there is going to be the important piece of it. Yeah, and then I also want to note out that after your acceptance, you apply to study abroad and after your acceptance, we will also give our student uh, a study abroad info info booklet and then in there you can find very detailed information of uh, how the credit transfer works and then what are the free 2000 means and then um, how's, how's the process is who do you need to contact uh, for example so make sure that if you are accepted read into the booklet to find relevant information uh, about credit transfer and so next question for career advisor is, what advice might you give to a student who is thinking about study abroad? Hmm, very good question. I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is have a open but flexible approach to this. So uh, I guess what that means for me is going into your study abroad, of course, with having uh, goals in mind and kind of understanding what you want to do, and what you want to get out of it, but being flexible enough to know that that might change when you're there and you might meet different people or be presented with different opportunities, uh, you know, for either, you know, day visits or something to that effect. So. I find that sometimes students come to me and they say, you know, oh, I wish that I had done X, Y, Z, or I wish that I had had taken more time to kind of explore these different opportunities. So um, I don't want you to be one of those students that have those regrets. So when you are planning for a study abroad trip or if you are just, you know, have your goals in mind, but also be prepared for those to kind of move around a little bit too. Thanks for the advice. And then the, a similar question for program counselor. So what has been your experience working with students who have gone on on exchange and maybe what are some advice that you, you will give to students? Uh, my advice is go. If you can go, go. I think it's an amazing opportunity. Uh, I was joking with the panel earlier. I had students come back from the pandemic who would still recommend that you go on exchange and that was of course a global pandemic and working with um, a host institution working through all of that and they still all had positive experiences so i think it's an amazing experience i definitely recommend if you can fit it in 
go. No regrets from students. Um, I think they love it. And I really do think that it's something that will help you grow as a person, will really impress employers, and will really showcase your independence and your ability to sort of step outside of your shell. I've had a couple of students go who are quite shy and they've admitted to being quite shy and they've really come out of their shell and really started to uh, branch out and do other new and crazy things. So I think it's a really positive experience. And if you think of anything after this entire fair, I think the advice is go apply and, and do it. Thanks for the advice. And then I hope students do decide to go on exchange. And uh, so that is, uh, we have one final question for the career advisor. Uh, what other supports may be of interest to students who participate in a study abroad program? Absolutely. So I always recommend that students check out our uh, experiential learning home page. So on there, we have a lot of pre-recorded webinars for you folks to view, and you can learn a bit about, you know, um, things like resumes, cover letters, of course, and just general uh, advice about careers. So I always recommend you have a look there first to see if there are things that can support you, you know, not just in a study abroad capacity, but in, uh, as you continue throughout your career journey as well. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to mention that I actually just thought of that uh, Melinda mentioned is um, when I was working as a recruiter, there were definitely instances where I would notice that students would uh, that have been in a study abroad capacity or maybe, you know, it took some time off after school to go on an exchange. And I always found that to be a really interesting thing. And I'd really ask them about that. You know, what did you learn? What uh, key takeaways did you learn from that experience? Uh, what's something interesting that that culture had that perhaps we did we, we don't have here in Canada. So uh, coming back prepared to talk about those things is something I recommend and uh, definitely an interesting thing to talk about with employers. But um, going back to talking about supports, like I mentioned, those webinars are a fantastic thing. And then don't be shy to book some time with us. I think a lot of students think that, you know, oh, the question I have is too small or they won't be able to answer that question or just a lot of uncertainty. Just book some time. You know, if we don't end up filling the entire appointment, that's OK. Uh, but you might get some clarity on the questions you might be having. So definitely book some appointment with a career advisor. Uh, thanks for both uh, Melinda and, uh, and Luisa for your insights and your time. And I also want to just conclude the session with um, uh, reinforce the information we have. Uh, so we posted our website in the announcement. So if you want to know more about studying abroad opportunities, you can go onto our website, yoguav.ca slash CIP to find out different kinds of programs, deadlines and supports available. And if you have any questions, feel free to email CIP at yoguav.ca. And if you want to connect more with your program counselor or with the career advisors, um, I know we have a website for uh, the contacts for all the program counselor for different degrees. So uh, uh, the link is um, it's yoguav.ca slash o yoguav.ca slash uaic slash program counselors. And uh, so for career advising, um, what well, uh, Luisa, what would be the best way for students to reach? Uh, career advisors. Yeah, great question. So easiest thing to do is to log into your account uh, on Experience Wealth and on the left hand side there is a tab for careers. So if you click on that, uh, you'll be able to book an appointment. And if you're not sure who your career advisor is, there is a little PDF there that is based on major. So you can find who your career advisor is uh, right on Experience Wealth there. Okay, thank you very much for your time and uh, I think the session will end at this point. The recordings will be available for you uh, at YouTube if you want to review some of the information and if you have any questions, feel free to let us know.